the roles that faith and religion play, uh, not against morality, but distinct from it. So I would want to argue there's more than one source of moral insight in life, what's right and wrong, and that it's conceivable that if someone with no spirituality could have a very high moral insight. I shared the, a panel this morning with another Harvard professor who would fit that description perfectly. Great moral insight. Religious tradition means just is unintelligible to him. So, I mean, it's and so then my final, my final set of themes of how spirituality works is I would want to distinguish and then relate wisdom and knowledge. It seems to me spirituality should be a source of wisdom, which is different than empirically gained rational knowledge. But I don't want to argue from that that spirituality is irrational or doesn't use reason. But there are differences. Come right in. Thank you. Um, I'd also, I mean, John, like what his own said, I'd also, spirituality, I think, is partly about prayer and grounding. That is to say, you think of public life. One of the things that can happen in public life is that people just get burned out. They just get exhausted from the enterprise. Uh, and sometimes public officials do kind of crazy things. You know, they go off and spend the state budget at Las Vegas or something, and we wonder why they do those things. And I think partly it is that the busyness, the pressure, and the sort of star character of a lot of public life, people lose their grounding. Now, anybody can lose their grounding, but that's... Um, and then thirdly, uh, I would want to argue that it's possible that a, at least certain traditions of spirituality uh, lead to a sense of what I call an ordered life, an ordered life. And I think an ordered life can uh, contribute to people's public life. The final point is there are downsides to spirituality. Uh, certitude without foundation, people who are convinced they are absolutely right when in fact they don't have enough evidence to know it. But they're in a public position, so the next thing you know you're at war because someone thought that, I mean, President McKinley said that when he wasn't sure whether to make war upon the Philippines or not, he knelt down beside his bed and when he stood up he was convinced that God had sent him to convert the heathens in the Philippines who had been Catholics for about three centuries by the time he came around. So sometimes spirituality isn't necessarily a help to public life. Amen. <laughs> um, I just wondered if you could comment on volunteers for ordinary citizens. Absolutely. I had those down actually. Before. I had volunteers in my head. I'm sorry. I, I, I'm conscious that we're both on this together, and I don't want to take any more time, so I have several things on here that I can have to go right ahead. Well, let me just say, Brian, that um, despite the fact that you and I come from traditions that are considered rather different, I, yeah. don't, <laughs> I don't differ with one word that you've said. That uh, might make some of my superiors nervous. <laughs> But, right but, not, but not for the first time. <laughs> it's what Kennedy School does to you. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, the tradition from which I come, a more free church tradition, arose here in, in New England in a time when the American Republic was just being formed. And I think the radical core of what our, my forebearers in faith tried to do was to bring to Old New England Puritanism a bit of that spirituality from Genesis. Uh, remembering that there is the mark of the image of God in every human being. A uh, real revival of Imago Dei thinking. If you go down on the Boston um, Public Garden, you'll see a big statue to a man named William Ellery Channing, uh, who, uh, it says, brought a humane spirit to New England theology. He did more than that. He actually inspired <coughs> people like Horace Mann, who was a parishioner of his, to uh, give up an opportunity for higher public office and make sure that every child had access to a free public education. He inspired Dorothea Dix, another parishioner, to go into the jails and uh, see their 
the image of God in people who suffered from mental illness and who were being incarcerated uh, for nothing more than that difficulty in their own spirits. Um, he inspired uh, people to begin to really wrestle with the important human rights causes of the abolition of slavery and the full participation of women in uh, public life. Our little group then over the years has produced a disproportionate number of people in elective office and public service, five U.S. presidents, some of them good and some of them not so good. <coughs> um, when I served as president of our denomination, I spent an inordinate amount of time uh, talking to uh, leaders in Washington who came from our group who uh, were struggling with burnout. And the, the challenges of operating in a electoral system where office holders are expected to raise tons of money from the day they enter office. Uh, even now, back in parish ministry, I spend time with, um, well, a, a parishioner who serves on our local board of selectmen who has decided to make herself available as a candidate for the state legislature. Same issues. But it's also true, I think, of working with volunteers who are engaged in a wide variety of uh, civic concerns. Uh, just the other night I was meeting with 20 of the 30 volunteers from my congregation and a few others who have uh, undertaken a partnership with a Boston public elementary school, the, the William Ellery Channing School. <laughs> whose principal reached out to us. But they're encountering they're all of the difficulties that go on in urban education. And the purpose of the meeting was really to have a kind of um, communal, spiritual recommitment to the whole enterprise. Because individual teachers um, can be difficult for volunteers to work with hard to listen to a teacher who, uh, whose customary response to the students is to yell at them. And just hang in there as a volunteer trying to give a child who doesn't have the opportunity to, have, to go home to anyone who can help them with English language acquisition. Um, acquire that skill, that all important um, learning skill. So yeah, my own sense of uh, the breadth of your topic this afternoon is, a, is as broad as Brian's. It's going to be up to you where you want to uh, engage us in uh, going a little bit deeper. Uh, Charlie Clements, who is the new director of the Car Center, is the person responsible for my being here this afternoon. Um, Charlie, of course, spent the last six and a half years leading our, um, our international human rights organization, the USC. And in, those, in that field, too, I've certainly experienced the, uh, the breadth of what Brian spoke about, both in terms of the spirituality and public service. Probably nothing meant more to me during my time as president than visiting with human rights activists in the uh, great Indian subcontinent, where for an accident of history, the, the Unitarians are responsible for uh, some uh, fairly large unasked for trust funds use those funds uh, very judiciously to uh, support people who are among the most uh, effective change agents in India, uh, people who are busily organizing um, women and people in the indigenous uh, Adivasi and, and Bali communities uh, to really have greater power. It's been tremendously interesting to me to see there are people who, uh, for good and justifiable conscientious reason, are uh, alienated from and separated from their original traditional religions. Also express a profound sense of what I would describe as more universal spirituality. Um, you know, spirituality is I think, what helps to sustain moral engagement. 
when we lose our grounding, however we conceptualize that, we easily fall into trouble, whether we're volunteers or elected officials or leaders in an NGO, however we serve. To maintain a sense of inner spiritual integrity, to maintain right relationship with those to whom we are most immediately accountable starting at home, to maintain right relationship with the people that we are engaged with in the common work. This can be all one of the most basic definitions of, of spirituality, whether we uh, have an invisible um, source of support or not that we regularly commune with. I often wish that some people would stay down on their knees a little bit longer. McKinley could have. <laughs> not only, yeah, McKinley could have, and in a more critical way. You know, there's the dialectic between uh, this kind of critical dialogue that we're doing this afternoon, which I think is terribly important to real spirituality that thinks critically, and the kind of contemplative life where we take uh, the best of the wisdom that we've been able to garner, um, the best of the nurturance and the examples that have come to us and hold ourselves inwardly accountable to those things. I went into religious life thinking I was going to go into the Foreign Service. And I made the decision the night that Martin Luther King was killed. I found that night that I felt more despairing about the future of my own country than I'd ever felt in my life. I was a senior at the college. And I knew that we had lost a prophetic figure. And I came to the conviction that I wanted to help serve communities that it would at least keep alive the questions that the great prophetic figures asked. Keep alive the question of what we're doing in the way of trying to serve justice. To uh, see a little bit more mercy and compassion in the world and to walk more humbly. Those are tough questions. They are among the most enduring in this culture. And um, so my vocational commitment has always been in service to people in forms of public service, to try to keep those questions open, and uh, to see that there are communities where the struggle for uh, justice, mercy, and humility are um, available because there are forms of public service that are not well done just in private prayer. They need a little bit more communal support. And that can be tough to find in public service. Uh, it can be tough to find. I can say more about that, but let me stop at this point and see where it is in your collective wisdom you want to plunge into dialogue with the two of us. One great <coughs> source of just a wonderful source of reflection out of John's tradition is William Ellery Channing has what he has a prayer he calls my symptom, which is just a terrific. It isn't it doesn't identify God very specifically, but it identifies a lot of things that anybody would do well to have in their life. It's, great it's, I, act, it's actually his nephew, William Henry Channing. Oh, is that the yeah. old? Well, I'll have to change the thing up over the desk. I got, up over the desk. <laughs> I got Ellery. I said, I know where this guy worked, and now I don't. All right. William and Henry. All right. Well, we ought to open this up. Well, thank you. Yes. Please just identify yourself as well. Hi, I'm Sarah from the Harvard Graduate School of Education. And one issue that's been bothering me about our public servants is the whole banking crisis and the whole foreclosure thing and how banks won't work with people. And it's bothering me even further that the other people are benefiting from the loss of these homes, that people are being encouraged to buy these foreclosed homes. And I know it's all economy and you've got to keep it moving and the tax credit is applying to everybody. I, I guess I just wanted to make that statement and get your opinion about that whole thing that 
um, that others are benefiting from somebody else's loss, and if that everybody pushed back and didn't buy those foreclosed homes as a country, which isn't going to happen, but they would push back on the banks to work with these people who have had unfortunate circumstances, lost a job. They would, you know. But anyway, that's just my, and that you talk about morality and spirituality, it's just not right. But for me, you know. Okay. We ought to hear from some folks and we'll talk, talk about things because we answer everything. Not that we have any answers. Yeah, right. <laughs> we respond to everything. <laughs> So at this school of public service where students are trained to be that people that may eventually burn out, you, the, the disconnect starts now, yes. right? When we're learning about different like environmental policy and you know these these are technical terms which are divorced from any source of morality, or like so you know looking at environmental rights could be looking at human greed about lack of concern about next generation, but that's not the way it's framed. And so starting from now, we're trying to divorce the human side from the problems that we have and we get to where we are now. And then when you go into the workplace, it's even harder to have a conversation about why are you doing this? Um, what are we doing collectively? Because you're under so much pressure to get things done. Um, and, and the incentive systems and everything is such that it's almost impossible. Um, and so I think, you know, I, I, I sit here with no recommendations and maybe this is not even a question. There's a sense of despair that, hey, like we're functioning under a system that's supposed to protect the church or the religious institutions of the separation of state and church, right? But right now it's come to a certain extent where um, your, your, the separation is, seems to be more permanent and strong than we would hope for. Church in West Newton, and uh, it's interesting your conversation about um, service and spirituality. The connection there is interesting because um, the survey of our congregation uh, we have quite an active um, social action program, and um, it was analyzed just recently by the board of directors, the board of trustees, and um, and spirituality and community were kind of way out in advance of social action. Social action was the next, next kind of most um, important thing to the congregation. And when we were talking about it, um, the social action committee was talking about it, we were, uh, everybody agreed that uh, when you're doing social action, it's a spiritual act. There was consensus about that. But it occurs to me that um, uh, that when we, uh, the, the Unitarian Universalist Association uh, has a whole program called Faith in Action, which implies that that's where to take your spiritual ideas to action. And it seems to me that it's that there are two ways of looking at it. One is that when you're doing a when you're doing social action, when you're doing uh, service work that you are, uh, you are grounded, as you said, in, in your faith or in your spirituality, but that people who just sit and um, meditate on their spirituality or just go to church services and think about uh, their, their life and whether they're doing the right thing and whether they're in, in the right moral place, um, in a way, I'd, I'd like to hear your comments on whether they're missing something by not not somehow involving themselves, even at whatever level they can, based on their personal circumstances, in a uh, in a service or a, um, a social action function. We get one more over here, then maybe we'll offer some yeah. remarks and response. Uh, I'm somewhat confused about what you mean by spirit spirituality. Uh, are you differentiating it between between spirituality and spiritual love, which uh, I take it uh, and, and raise the question is is equivalent to a kind of agape, this this notion of non physical love, which uh, uh, is 
in, in, in psychiatric terms, in depth psychology, depth psychiatric terms, is, is a little bit is similar to, but not identical to, repression. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, I, I uh, personally am, am feeling very burned out myself. I'm kind of a volunteer, perpetual volunteer, Sisyphus, Sisyphus, Sisyphian volunteer. And and uh, I, I guess uh, I guess I, I just wonder whether you agree with any of those uh, notions, and and whether it, it, the, the the church. Uh, is, is, is kind of you know, between the rock and a hard place at this point in, 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 in some of these respects. I, I don't, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm very sympathetic, but uh, at the same time, somewhat perplexed uh, as, to, as to what somebody who's really burned out should do. Uh, uh, Let's see. John, what you talk Well, you know, um, I think all of us go through periods of burnout. When I was serving as a, a president of our denomination, I had a thousand congregations to oversee all, all across the, the United States, and I ended up working myself into a frazzle. Um, uh, Bill Berry became my spiritual advisor. Oh, yeah. Jesuit. Jesuit. <laughs> <laughs> What'd you do with the Trinity? But I won't answer that. <laughs> the least of my problems. All right. <laughs> it's okay. I'm just wondering. The least of my problems. Um, I actually needed to find someone that I could regularly talk to about what I was doing to feel loved and whether that wasn't imbalanced by working too hard, when in fact I needed to recognize that I needed to be centered in gratitude for my the love of my wife and my family, for God's love, um, that I could only do any good to others if I had a kind of centered sense of spiritual love that I dwelt in before I attempted to be a distributor. And so, you know, that would be one of my, uh, one of my uh, primary concerns. And when I, when I would call on people serving in very difficult public posts, I would be, without prejudging their vocabulary or their needs, uh, try to listen to whether their lives were in balance. And that, I think, isn't a very important thing. I, I guess I'll throw in a response about the, the, um, the survey at your congregation. Uh, don't assume that people who express their need for spiritual depth in the life of a congregation are not engaged in action. Um, Brian was very wise in recognizing that people who serve in the professions are engaged in public service whether they are volunteering their time through the congregation as social activists or not. Our congregations are loaded with public servants in that broad term. Um, and therefore, for them to be seeking greater spiritual depth in order to, to sustain their professional and public service uh, does not disturb me yet one iota. I think that in fact it may be a very necessary rebalancing of their lives that I would support. Hey, let me try and pick up a couple of things. The financial crisis, I mean, is filled with moral questions that uh, are, and that they could by extension become uh, spirituality questions. Uh, I mean, the moral questions are questions about the public policy as a whole. For example, the kind of thing that's going on in the Congress right now where you ought to have financial regulation, you couldn't raise that at any point in time. And when you raise it now, it is a highly technical question, but it's a highly technical question where the moral stakes of how you decide that question are, are going to be important to figure out. The question about 
how people benefit in a society and grow, I, uh, you know, benefit one from the other. I see that. I don't know exactly how to make policy on that basis. I think if you practice any literature by those homes, I'm not terribly sure the outcome of that. I'm not a pure consequentialist, but I'm partly a consequentialist, yeah. so I want to know what the intent is and what the outcome is. So, and so I mean, I think, I think that topic is filled with, uh, uh, I mean, how people, how people, um, very often, people in public life can have very strong personal moral codes. They often don't have a connection from that code to the public consequences of what their vocation is. Uh, I, I remember when a, when a part of my life, I spent 20 years on the National Conference of Catholic Bishops doing staff work for them on domestic policy and, and uh, foreign policy questions for them in Washington. And one of the things we did in the late 80s, we were going to do a document for the public debate on the third world debt problem. This was the first round of third world debt, not not the HIPAA programs, no, not the HIPAA programs, which was second round. But the third world debt in the 1980s was basically a Latin American debt owed to primarily American banks. So it was different than the 90s, where the money was owed to Bank of Boston. Especially. IMF. Well, they were big, but but anyway, we went down to New York and. Um, four or five bishops and a group of the staff went down to New York and met with six of oh, six major bankers. They basically held the Latin American debt. And two or three of them were Catholic, but not all. And they were very pleasant. Uh, we had a good discussion, serious discussion. They didn't dismiss the question. But I must confess, I watched them as that discussion went along. And I was convinced the underlying question they were struggling with is why are these guys here asking this kind of question? That's not their, that's not their menu. That's not their functional. That's our kind of question. But why are they asking? Them? So I think, I think, uh, there are a couple of these people I I knew of in some detail come from a strong personal moral code, but the connection to the larger macro issue. So that then goes to Amy's question about the split. I think there's two dimensions to the split. Uh, one is, at the again, at the moral level, I would always distinguish empirical data and moral analysis, no matter what the problem is I'm trying to deal with, I'm trying to deal, I'm trying to deal with the financial crisis. Um, let me put it this way. You have to know the nature of the empirical problem before you can offer good moral advice. You offer the good moral advice, and it isn't based on an understanding of the problem. Your moral advice may compound the problem. So at one level, I don't know if I want to split, but I want a distinction. I don't want a person of good heart and great intentions and no understanding of the problem offering advice. So there's one. Now there's a second split you're talking about, I think, is whether we so define questions in a secular sense that we close off the problem in its secular content and say there's no room for either moral or spiritual insight into the problem. Now, I think you were in the end were probably referring to the constitutional separation of things, or maybe not. But in any case, that's a different kind of question, I think, than how you do moral analysis of complex public policy problems. So then, what about the split? I think certainly a person with a certain quality of spiritual insight will add something to the discussion about the moral and the empirical that might not be there if they didn't have spiritual quality. But again, I wouldn't want to say that someone couldn't make a good moral judgment if they had spiritual Finally, spirituality, again, I tried to describe this at the beginning. I, I think in its basic terms, it is a sense that there is something beyond the tangible, empirical, that one can be in living contact with. Uh, how one then develops that spirit and how one uses it. Um, I do a course here on, on statecraft where we look at world leaders. There are two different individuals that you can contrast. Of all people, Henry Kissinger once said about Bismarck, 
that Bismarck had the good fortune to believe in a God who always agreed with him. <laughs> 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 now that's a use of spirituality that is problematical. <laughs> On the other hand, somebody like Lincoln, Lincoln who had, as far as we can tell, very little of a structured communal faith, but a Bible that was dog-eared from his reflections on it himself. So that's a good example of spirituality without necessarily organized religion. As a matter of fact, Lincoln once said, he said, on Monday I had a group of ministers from the North telling me that we should go to war to end slavery. And on Tuesday, I had a group of ministers from the South who told me it was God's will that we not go to war to end slavery. And Lincoln said, my only thought was, since I have to make the decision if God was going to speak to anybody, I would have thought he spoke to me rather than the ministers. <laughs> yeah. So there was a certain uh. wisdom in that, too. Let's do another round. Yes, second, second. I, I'd like to say oh, just sure. a few I'm things on, a, on these two questions over here. Uh, the trying to operate in a, in a global economy where economics is sometimes treated as religion <laughs> is a challenge to all of us. Um, that's, by the way, the title of a, a favorite book of mine by an economist at the, the University of Maryland, Economics as Religion. Hmm. He does an interesting um, parsing of the two major schools of economics that uh, have dominated American political economy, uh, the so-called Cambridge School and the Chicago School. And um, despite the fact that many of the leading figures in both schools are uh, Jewish, he does the interesting distinction that he thinks that um, the Cambridge School represented a greater sense of the Catholic value of solidarity even with the poor. Whereas the Chicago School comes out of Protestant individualism. And I would suggest that one of the things that has happened in the last 30 years is that much of our public discourse in this country has tended to revolve around not only uh, a worship of uh, the market as though it were God, its judgments true and righteous in all respect. When in fact the market always, from the earliest times, to be fair to those who come to the marketplace uh, at disadvantage, has required uh, religious and spiritual authority to say, why don't you enter the marketplace asking the question, how would you like to be treated by the person that you are doing business with? So when we uh, try to, in, in religious service to, uh, to speak to the economic powers and principalities, uh, we're required to both recognize the, the, the reality of economic power. I, when I was at the Divinity School, shocked my advisor by enrolling for several courses in economics because I knew very well that I was going to be trying to exercise public uh, moral and spiritual leadership in a world where economic power was very significant and if I didn't understand the workings of the marketplace, I would be at a, uh, you know, disempowered. But I think the other split that I heard in Amy's talk was the, the split between, not to put too fine a point on it, but so the idealism and realism. We know that we would like to have a, a communal life in which a, a sense of a shared responsibility, even for the vulnerable, was more widely shared. But in fact, we know that we live in a culture where um, there is a tremendous divide between those who want to emphasize that and who are often then called socialists and those who want to em uh, emphasize what Emerson in my own tradition called self-reliance. I don't believe that 
those two ends of the dilemma are quite as hard for us who are trying or wrestling in the public sphere as the, uh, the effort to, uh, to bridge the gap between the realities of what we have to deal with out there and the injustices and our own ideals. I go back to the uh, American pragmatist William James who said that the only way to deal with that tension, that internal split, which I think is often is with some combination of recognizing that perhaps the reality, we have had a misconception about the realities to begin with. My own mentor, William Sloan Coffin, used to say often to those of us who deal with issues that leave us disillusioned, try asking yourself why you entertain delusions to begin with. We often don't understand quite well enough as we go into these difficult things the workings and motivations and realities of, of, of power. And then we also have to think about how to lift up the power of people who hold ideas but who don't have adequate power. This is where human rights organizing is often uh, uh, very significant. It's where the congregationally based community organizing gives voice to people who don't uh, have access to the same leverage. Congregationally based community organizing right here in Boston, for example, is in fact working with people who are in danger of having their homes foreclosed. So lifting up the, 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 the disempowered who hold important ideals and then ratcheting down um, our own sense of um, the gap and coming back to ourselves and saying, you know, we, we have some accountability, too, about having had too many illusions. That, that seems to be terribly important in, in managing uh, spirituality and public service. Do you have a more question? Yeah, I just wanted to ask a question about the moral dimensions in preventing genocide mm. and, uh, and poverty. Because I mean, genocide has happened twice in one decade, oh. and uh, and also poverty increasing, despite uh, despite the Millennium um, Development Goals. Okay. Well, I think let us collect a couple. Of yeah, we'll come back. Okay. Uh, oh, thanks. Thank so. you again. Uh, I had two kind of ideas that I've been working with, especially in regards to the spirituality and human rights, and so. I'm really interested in like public acts, so where does, where can civics kind of meet people in the commons and so, you know, the Star Spangled Banner, or, you know, America the Beautiful, you know, Pledge of Allegiance, you know, these are things that seem in like sports culture, you know, where will, can we, you know, can Americans, especially in this context, reinvigorate that public space and, and you know, in, in one way that I thought, um, well, that's a separate thing. That's really going nowhere, but that's just my thought. Where can that come back into, into how can, if Americans want to rebuild their image, um, you know, obviously the self-reliance is there, but the reliance, I think, is too heavy on the government sometimes to, to follow through with that kind of yeah. hope or that power, which is really illusory. And then secondly, what are your thoughts about, you know, uh, <clears throat> Thich Nhat Hanh, who's the Vietnamese Buddhist monk, I thought it would be great to engage him on, you know, meditation for public servants. If you have contentious parties trying to mediate, not that they have to pray together, but if they actually took the physical act of being silent for the first ten minutes of their meeting before actually having really hard discussions, could that create a space for actually cooling tempers or, you know, these are kind of hot pie in the hot sky stuff, but I think the practical measures to actually advance these kind of spaces, and I think that's where my my, my question was leading. Is like where do we where can we create spaces? Since you know spirituality is very fought over, sacred sites even become very political. It's like you have to actually find neutral places in some sense. So, so I'm Jeff Roddy, I'm a nuclear student, and, and he's uh, from the economist. Yeah. So watch out for what he gets going on the market stuff. So it's not foreign territory. Right. Anyway. I'm a dual Swiss American citizen. I grew up as a child, um, actually Cape Canaveral, and I have now come back for the first time in quite some time. And 
and I, well, I really wasn't burnt out, but I probably easily could have been burnt out with all the financial crisis and things. But I, I, I must say I'm, I'm quite disillusioned from sort of what I've seen since I've gotten back here. And, and I think this, I, I, I don't know to what extent what I'm saying sort of speaks to other people, but you know, it, 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 it seems like we're fighting an uphill battle, that you know, family unit is, te is deteriorating. You know, we have a increasing allegiance to any type of spiritual faith. Um, the bigger the political issue, the more dysfunctional it seems to be you know, for us to sort of galvanize and, and get around and, and sort it out compared to you know, 20 years ago when we decided we were going to make a demise and we did something. Um, and, and to your point, I would agree that the sort of capitalism, that if you look at any measure of this equality of income, you know, it just seems to be sort of a relatively indiscriminate, you know, useless, winner take all approach to markets. Which have, as you said, have failed a number of times to huge suffering and um, disequality to a lot of people. So, I, I, and, and, and I agree that you know any type of leadership requires bringing people to reality before you decide sort of normally where would you like to go. And I, you know, it just strikes me that I'm not sure we're really there in terms of people being honest about what the reality of the situation, what the gravity and magnitude of the problem is. Um, and I think there are a lot of people out there who would like to find a spiritual solution, including myself. Um, but I, we just don't see it on the menu. I don't know if that makes sense, but um, at least that's my situation. I don't want to extrapolate that over other people. But I guess the two points is that one is that I, I do think the reality is probably far more severe. And I think a place like Harvard, you know, if it doesn't come, if it can't be realistic here, where can we be? And the second question is maybe for the, as a sort of shifting responsibility towards you, you know, can spiritual leaders come up with maybe just a better menu to, to, to attract people like this to? Okay. Well, we can talk about the economy. Well, okay. <laughs> so we started with modest problems. What do you do know about genocide and poverty? <laughs> <laughs> We ended up with a guy from the London Economist telling us the market's out of whack. So <laughs> I guess there's a good reason for this seminar. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, let me start and then go back because I mean, the poverty and genocide. My goodness. Uh, I, I mean, I I think um, there are a couple of things that uh, might be useful to say. Uh, I think uh, a the spiritual view of reality is more likely to acknowledge that while the, the world empirically as we know it is governed by sovereign states, dramatically influenced by corporations, international organizations, while all that's true, the moral unit, of the moral unit of human affairs is the human community. So if you don't acknowledge that from the beginning, then you reduce the world to the interaction of states, the relationships of corporations and states, the relationship of international organizations and NGOs, all of which I would argue are really important topics. But they need to be grounded in a sense that there is a human community that precedes the society they precede corporate. Now, the only point about that is that if you hold that, then the two problems you talk about, which are you know, the, the talk I gave this morning, the theme was it was all diplomats, and the theme was the world of 2010. Well, the world of 2010 uh, has got these two problems on the table. And depending on where you start on this first question, I think you might go in different directions when you your both. But if you accept the notion of a single human community, then you can still, I think you need to make room for states, corporations, international organizations. But there's a sense of urgency then when part of that human community is under attack. And you will get lots of arguments why People shouldn't intervene, people should leave it alone, it isn't worth the candle, you, you know, can't afford to do any more. 
you will get a different answer to that question, even though I can't tell you exactly what the right answer is about what to do about it. You mean, whether you send in the 82nd Airborne or you send in ECOWAS or you send in, you know, whoever you do. So there are further questions, but the fundamental reality and the fact of carbon. I mean, again, you know, you, depending on what lens you look at over the last 50 years, you can either say infant mortality <coughs> has been significantly decreased, the hunger has been enhanced, or you can say that there are six billion people in the world and at least one billion of them live on a dollar a day and three billion altogether live on less than two dollars a day. Well, the fact that you've decreased infant mortality may not necessarily by any means put you at rest about a, a third of the human community living on less than two dollars a day. So, that then takes you again, though, into complicated problems about what to do with it. I understand that. But I do think if you just stuck with the scene of spirituality, the place I would have to leverage is on this basic assumption of to whom we're related, to whom we're related, which I mean for whom we're responsible. Now, I think people have different responsibilities. Some are living in, in Brussels has responsibility to his or her family, to their community, to their nation, but they do have a responsibility to the human family. And order. Thomas Aquinas said there was an order of charity. There's an order of charity. And the order of charity means there's different responsibilities to different people, but ultimately you have some responsibility to everyone. And then the question is how do you work out that? So how do you want to and, and I mean, the market does some good things. The market does, is incapable of doing everything that needs to be done to deal with those problems. This problem. So then you have to ask how you use the assets of the market and how you couch it in broader policy that makes up for what the market doesn't do. For a long time, I think people on the more um, communally concerned, progressive, liberal, moderate end of the religious spectrum, seeded the, um, the marketplace of ideas and symbols to uh, folks uh, who were more adept at the marketing and privatization of religion. Um, I've got a book on my reading desk currently called Thieves in the Temple. Um, the Christian Church and the Selling of the American Soul uh, goes back to the question of what kind of religion is in the marketplace? Largely privatized religion. Uh, it strikes me. A <coughs> colleague and friend of mine back in the early 90s uh, wrote and published to no great acclaim uh, a, a book called God and Other Famous Liberals. <laughs> um, pointing out that if it weren't for the patience and generosity of the divine, um, you know, we wouldn't be where we are. Uh, seems to put up with quite a lot, quite a liberal way. Um, the goal he was aiming at was for a uh, more progressive people to reclaim some of the central symbols, including, uh, you know, reminding people that the uh, the flag stands for more than knee-jerk chauvinism and patriotism. It, it actually stands for some hard-won uh, principles of freedom built into the Bill of Rights, but also uh, the kind of uh, due process that we aspire to in a democracy. The flag needs to be reclaimed, I think, from uh, the kind of uses it's received in what a friend of mine calls the, the empire of illusions. This is Chris Hedges, who used to be with the New York Times. Even family life, which uh, I agree has been damaged in 
in contemporary society has been damaged in no small part because of the, uh, the sweeping impact of the market in privatizing everything. You know, we used to have supports for raising children in the society. Now you get people who say, if you want to have kids, it's an expensive hobby. Do it on your own. The, uh, the lack of social support for, uh, for people attempting to maintain decent family integrity. Never mind the exclusions from the privileges that heterosexual families enjoy by people who are doing an amazing job sometimes of raising other people's kids. Hmm. One of my pet causes, the national co-chair of Freedom to Marry. Um, these things, I think, need to be looked at in a broader um, spiritual perspective than is often given in a media where the typical debate is not Brian and me. It's some person from the religious right and somebody holding up a version of secular individualism. where the efforts to speak out of the wisdom traditions that, uh, that maybe have something to say to the market are completely shut out by the media market itself. So we have a media culture that is dominated by uh, narcissistic in, uh, focus on the, uh, the foibles of celebrities rather than on the issues of, of the common good. And uh, I think we have a fair amount of um, well-entrenched economic and political uh, force that wants to keep people distracted with that stuff, rather than engaged in serious dialogue about the human future, the human family. To be in public service today, then, is to go into a, 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 an arena where we are distracted from distraction by distraction, as Eliot put it, and to try to help reclaim attention, which is a spiritual virtue in and of itself, to the things that are most human and humane and that matter most in the long run. Uh, this is where I think, uh, you know, a, a, a wise teacher like Thich Nhat Hanh does indeed have much to, to offer. Uh, religion gets an enormous amount of bad press. But where it works well, it is reclaiming attention to those things where human vulnerability and human yearning to be better than we are, uh, can really be, be mo better mobilized. I worked for a number of years with an organization called uh, Religions for Peace, the nature of which is to get people in areas where religion is being dragged into ethnic and political economic conflict, to push against the identity politics that exploit religious people, and to come back to the higher ideals and purposes of their own traditions. Just yesterday, I was or maybe it was this morning, I was reading about a, a, a an apology, a public apology in Bosnia. Yes, yeah, yeah, Card Cardinal Pujic. Who's a Croatian. And Mustafa Saric, and the president of, of uh, Croatia. Yeah, Croatia. Uh, I remember so vividly the, the role through religions and peace that the Vatican played in getting Cardinal Puyic and the and the, the, the ecumenical part patriarch played in getting the uh, Pavel, the, the uh, Serbian Orthodox patriarch, to stop just reinforcing the use of their religious traditions in ethnic conflict and to come back to realizing that at the core of the spiritual traditions from which they emanate, they needed to put attention on the reality of what was happening on the ground in the misuse of religion and on their own uh, core values. This doesn't happen often enough, but 
the fact it, when it does, it, it gets about as much attention as a plane landing rather than crashing. Uh, I'd go back for a minute to the public space, the space question. Um, the space question is what I meant uh, in part when I talked about how people ground their life. Uh, uh, that is to say, how do you find space in which to ground your life personally and communally? For myself, I'm not one, but I, I always were one for monks because their life is ordered to be around it. So they, you know, from the time, at least in my tradition, from the time they rise in the morning to the time they go to bed at night, so every hour of the day it's ordered. It is ordered primarily around, around prayer in the monastery, so everything else they do, even though they end up making great bread, so they're great on the market. And, and stuff like that, but that, that's all to be done uh, having ordered first the most important thing we want. Now, we can't live like monks and days just uh, a certain time, uh, but there is a way that everybody ought to have an order. Everybody ought to have an order that grounds them. And what it takes to fill that order out will differ, I think, by tradition and personnel but the sense that there's a kind of systematic rhythm to life that grounds one in reflection, in prayer, in some form. A communal connection, I think. Yeah, yeah that's, that's true, too. But I mean, I, mean I, I think not everybody, I mean, that it would certainly be my tradition, but yeah. I've always been fascinated by Dag Hammarskjöld. Yes. Now, Dag Hammarskjöld was a deeply reflective spiritual person who was Secretary General of the UN died in a plane crash in the Congo when he was trying to mediate the Congo in the early 70s. This literature on his life came out after he was dead. There's a book called Markings, which were these journalistic entries that he made. But Hammerschel, no one ever thought of Hammerschel, I think, as a religious person in the public arena, maybe his close friends did. But after he died, it became clear that he had a quite developed spiritual life, uh, eclectic, drawn from everywhere, but it grounded him. And that's a good example of somebody being able to do that in a very tough job. Yes, sir. I think you had raised your I hand. Was, I was about to. I think you, you sensed it or you said <laughs> I saw you. I saw you. Uh, my name is Jeff Stone, and uh, I'm an organizational consultant in Boston on diversity issues, work with different communities. I also serve on the board of a group called the Jewish Alliance for Law and Social Action, based in Boston. And we work on a variety of social and economic justice issues. And my question is, um, it, it's touched with the cynical a little bit. I'm not a cynical person. And in the Jewish Alliance for Law and Social Action, our members uh, range from totally secular Jews. Actually, we have some non-Jews, but mostly Jewish totally secular, non-observant, to Orthodox Jews. And that's fine. And we choose to gather under this umbrella or work together in the Jewish Alliance uh, on various issues. And, and my question is, uh, we may be, it may be a secular substitute, this organization, for getting good with God. Okay? So uh, we could work, and we do, many of us work for uh, activist organizations on a variety of issues outside of JALSA, that's the acronym. Um, but we choose to also be members of JALSA and participate in its activities, further its, its issues, and even if we're not observant Jews. So is that okay? I mean, people work for Catholic charities, different aspects of Catholic charities, UU uh, social action committees and other groups that are affiliated with uh, faith groups, they may not have any profound experience of faith at all, and may not even need to, yet they choose to work through UU, Catholic Charities, a Jewish group. The net effect is they're doing good in the world, but they may not have any profound experience of God or faith. I'd just like your comments on that. Well, it does go back to what I originally said, was that I wanted to distinguish First of all, multiple levels of the meaning of spirituality. And secondly, I wanted to distinguish rather 
dramatically the monology and the spirituality. My purpose is not to separate them, but to distinguish them. So, for example, as I said in the beginning, it is crucial to always say 